Hey everyone, welcome back to the Training Cafe. Eric Hurst here, coming to you from sunny Lander, Wyoming, one of my favorite places to visit in the summer. Uh, got friends here, got some great climbing here, got some consistently good weather though, on the warm side here uh, in the summer. And uh, I'm just kind of finishing up here and uh, gonna uh, fly to California for some business for a couple of days later this week and then back to Pennsylvania to work and pay bills and uh, do family stuff and, uh, and also start a bit of a training block between my summer season and my fall climbing season. And I think that's a topic I'll talk about in the next episode of Training Cafe. But this episode, I want to talk about dealing with summer weather conditions because, you know, many of us travel and uh, for some of us, this might be kind of your peak climbing season, your greatest opportunity to travel and get outdoors and boulder and route climb or big wall. And, uh, you know, the weather can be challenging, you know, sometimes less than ideal for climbing your very, very best. So I want to touch on that here briefly. And then I'll take some of your questions later on in the episode. I see a few uh, folks have typed in uh, training questions, performance questions already, and I'll get to them uh, in just a bit. But of course, this is the Training Cafe, and uh, we begin each episode sipping coffee together. Now, I have my coffee here somewhere, hiding behind my laptop. There it is. And let's raise our cups together. If you've got your coffee or other beverage, let's sip together. Climbers around the world, unite. Coffee, my beverage of choice in the morning and midday. And then I kind of cut myself off about two in the afternoon so that I can sleep uh, at night. Um, okay, and now uh, one other thing we do here in the cafe each time is a shout out. Uh, this shout out, uh, again, um, like the last episode, uh, World Cup focused, I guess you would say, because I've really been uh, the last few years enamored of the World Cup circuit. I know it's not for everybody, the whole competition climbing thing, but uh, I know a lot of the personalities that are on the World Cup circuit, and I've been to World Cup events myself, and uh, of course my company, Fizzy Vantage, we sponsor a few World Cup climbers, so it's, it's fun to kind of watch the pro league uh, and um, you know see you know just in some incredible performances and you know some excellent drama at times uh, and so in any case uh, shout out to Jesse Gruper uh, USA uh, male climber who won gold in uh, the lead World Cup this past weekend um, and uh, also Natalia Grossman a Fizzy Vantage nutrition athlete uh, won bronze in lead uh, Brooke Rabbit, who just missed out, I think she got fourth place. Yanya Gambert is back on the lead circuit, dominating. Uh, she won first, and uh, the young Korean climber Seo got second. So, um, uh, and, and again, on the men's side, Jesse Grouper won gold, and um, uh, Alex Megos, friend of mine, uh, won bronze. Uh, and I um, am kind of have a brain fart here uh, who won the silver uh, for men's this past weekend. I want to say it was a, a Japanese climber, but um, I'm um, missing out um, brain freeze here <laughs> on who won the men's silver this past weekend. But I really enjoy watching uh, these World Cup events. If you haven't done it, you should watch a final sometime. It's quite engaging. The bouldering season is over. The lead climbing season is on a break now for a few weeks. I think there's one more lead event in the UK in early September. And, and actually, I think another one in uh, Slovenia or Czech Republic um, in, in the early fall season. But if you Google IFSC climbing, you'll come into the um, sport climbing website uh, where they have the calendar of all the events and the schedules and eventually uh, the links for streaming on YouTube. And some of these comps are uh, appearing here in the United States um, delayed on ESPN uh, or the Olympic Channel. Uh, it's changed a, a couple times uh, the last few years, so I can't keep track of it. But uh, it's uh, neat to see them getting some uh, broadcast television exposure as well. Uh, okay, so enough with that stuff. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the main topic, which is summer climbing and performance, um, and then I'll get to your questions uh, if you type them into the comments box uh, in just a few minutes. Now, I, I want to preface this discussion 
to say that when I was a younger man, a young, enthusiastic uh, climber, uh, you know, teenager, a 20-something, so we're talking the 70s and the 1980s, before climbing gyms, I was all about climbing year-round. I would be out climbing in the cold when there's snow in the ground, at least bouldering a little bit. Uh, and uh, in the summer, I would be out uh, putting up new routes at the New River Gorge, despite the summer heat and humidity and kind of rainforest conditions in West Virginia uh, at times in the summer. Uh, it didn't stop me, um, though I did obviously realize uh, that the warm, muggy conditions of the eastern United States or the dry heat out west wasn't ideal for climbing my best, but I didn't care. I was going to climb. And so many of you are perhaps like that, uh, that you will climb in any and all weather um, and uh, not complain. And uh, as you get a little older, you get a little more picky. And also things have changed since my young days. There are now climbing gyms. So if it's too hot to climb outdoors or to climb your best outdoors, you can do summer training blocks. Um, in the comfort of an indoor gym, uh, hopefully air-conditioned indoor gym. Uh, and so, you know, my perspective has kind of changed a little bit. You know, I travel sometimes in the summer, as I'm doing now, to climb. But, you know, I will go home and do a training block for four or six weeks in the summer. Uh, I do most of my training in my home gym, uh, but I will occasionally go to a large commercial gym. And so, you know, I think today, climbers, you have the best of both worlds. You can hopefully schedule a trip or two during the summer season, but also have a quality training block that you know, you're building your conditioning and your strength and power and uh, maybe heading into the fall season uh, in really, really good shape. And you know, so it's a lot different than my young days where there was no indoor option. It was just all about climbing outdoors. So uh, yes, I'm a little more picky about my conditions. And also, um, you know, uh, as you get older, more of a veteran climber, you know, you get more goal focused and uh, you want to be uh, more choosy on how you invest your time. You know, for me, when I travel, um, I, I do enjoy on-site climbing, stuff that's not so uh, close to my limit. Uh, you know, this trip I've on-site a lot of, you know, a do couple dozen, I think, you know, like 512A type climbs. Uh, which is really fun because you, you climb a lot of routes, you win a lot. Um, occasionally I fall, you know, uh, in those types of on-site grades. Uh, but then, you know, sometimes I run into a project route, something in the 513 range that I need better conditions, I need to probably invest a few days into, or at least a few tries into, and, uh, and that's where it can get tricky, is when you're trying to climb at your limit. The conditions are a difference maker. You know, those precious low gravity days where everything lines up and you climb your very best and you send your project or you on-site your hardest ever route, it's usually a confluence of things. Uh, good weather being one of them, having really quality conditions, low humidity, cool, crisp air, you know, not sweating off the holds. Uh, you know, when your body overheats, it becomes less efficient uh, in terms of uh, generating energy and uh, performing. And, uh, you know, so, you know, the, the weather does impact performance, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, many other things as well. Your diet, you know, how well you've slept recently. You know, how, have you had a couple of rest days or have you climbed a couple of days in a row? You're not going to be in the same place physically in terms of your strength and power and, you know, ner nervous system function. And so, you know, those low gravity days are when everything tends to line up and there's this confluence of factors that help you climb your very, very best. Um, so, you know, for me, if I have one of those harder routes, you're trying to get things to line up like that way. You know, you're looking at the weather forecast. Is there a cooler day of the week that I can plan to get to my project or at least know what time of the day it's going to be ideal. Uh, case in point, you know, my son, uh, Jonathan, my younger son, has a project, one of his few remaining lines here to do in Lander uh, up at Wild Iris, uh, a rock called Mutation. It's a 9A. And uh, it bakes in the sun most of the day. Uh, it, it doesn't actually get in the shade completely until about 6.30 uh, p.m., you know, in the, in the evening. So uh, there's a small window of opportunity after the shade hits uh, that it cools down before it gets too dark to climb. And so we've been up there a couple of evenings, uh, you know, for him to work on, the, you know, 
getting a couple of red point goes. Really, you only get two because it's a long, hard route, but also because uh, you know we were up two nights ago. Uh, it was basically pitch dark, and he had to put a headlamp on for his second go. So there's a small window of opportunity. You know, during the afternoon, he, it's, it's not climbable in the sun uh, to do a nine. You know, his first nine A, uh, and it's a very long, very steep route, uh, complicated technical climb, uh, and so. Uh, uh, you know, today we're going to head up there. I'm going to do some climbing in the afternoon, uh, hopefully find some shade somewhere, and then we'll head to his route, uh, and he'll get a couple goes in as the sun is setting, and hopefully the air gets cool enough. And so, you know, picking your time of day, you know, knowing when your route is going to be in the sun and when it's in the shade, knowing how the uh, ambient temperature conditions vary, uh, you know, my other son is working on a project in Sinks Canyon where he has to literally be up before sunrise, warming up to get to the route, to give it a couple of goes before 9 a.m. So it's kind of the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and, uh, you know, because once the sun hits at 9 a.m. in Sinks Canyon, uh, you know, it's all over in terms of climbing, you know, uh, uh, 8C plus or whatever the route is he's working on up there. Uh, and of course, elevation is a big factor. Now, in the eastern United States, most climbing areas aren't too far from sea level, so it, it's hot and humid no matter where you're at. But out west, you can you know go up in elevation and uh, seek cooler temperatures. Uh, I was a, a week ago at Ten Sleep Canyon, uh, which is a, uh, a canyon. You know, the road kind of ascends, uh, and there's cliffs at many different levels. There's uh, sectors down low at 5,500 feet. There's a couple of sectors up at 9,000 feet. So the difference, you know, on a, a sunny, well-mixed air day, uh, temperature cools on average about five degrees per thousand feet. And so, you know, if you're at the cliff, uh, it, it intense sleep low in the canyon at five or 6,000 feet, it could be 85, 90 degrees or even higher, uh, even in the shade. So it's pretty brutal. Uh, those areas are more kind of spring and fall climbing spots, or you get there really early in the day. Uh, higher in the canyon, up at Crag 6 or at Tyrell at 9,000 feet, uh, it could be a full 20 degrees cooler. You know, so while it's 85 down um, at, at the lower walls or 90, it could be 65 or 70 up at Crag 6 or Tyrell. Uh, and so you can use elevation to your favor to seek out the ideal conditions. So, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind. And, you know, certainly in Europe, there are those same situations where you can use elevation um, and time of day, you know, at Seyus, for, for example, you know, it gets a lot of morning sun and then it gets the afternoon shade. So most people aren't even hiking up the hill until the midday. Uh, and then eventually when the shade hits, you're up at pretty high elevation, you can get some uh, nice conditions there in the summer. And so there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, of course, I'm a weather weenie. I, I love following the weather and uh, uh, I'm a kind of a student uh, uh, that has uh, really um, come to recognize how elevation and weather patterns and time of day affect uh, the climbing conditions. It seems like a trivial matter perhaps to a beginner climber or to someone that's climbing at lower levels, but if you're pushing your limit, these are real factors to, con, uh, to consider uh, and perhaps even, um, you know, like my younger son has a, a journal where he records all of his uh, uh, climbing uh, achievements and projecting efforts and, you know, right down to recording the temperature and the humidity uh, uh, at the crag on uh, days that he's working his project so he kind of can come up with correlations between how he feels and, and and what the actual objective data is, you know, carrying a little sensor, one of those little pocket thermometer hygrometers that you can buy off of Amazon for 10 or 20 bucks. You know, it's, it's fun to throw one of those in your pack and uh, place it uh, at the base of the climb and then you can see and track temperature and humidity throughout the day or the evening, uh, but also day to day and you can kind of get some sense of what conditions feel best on that particular rock type because you know limestone feels different than sandstone and different from granite um, and so there might not be one best temperature for you it might actually be slightly different
you know, temperature and humidity conditions, uh, depending on the rock type. So more data, the better. Okay, so I, I guess enough there. Uh, we're about 15 minutes in, and I see um, quite a few questions typed in, so let's get to them. The, uh, it's the time where I answer a viewer questions, so let me just scroll on up here and see who's first in the list. And uh, if you have a training, performance, nutrition, injury question, I would be happy to take a shot at answering it here uh, over the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes before we close the cafe for the day. Okay, so first up from Sam, he says, Hey Eric, uh, I've been doing the 753 protocol with added weight on a 15 millimeter edge for uh, two seasons now. And, and that's one of my favorite advanced uh, hangboard training pro protocols that I myself use and have um, uh, you know, been a big promoter of. He asks, what is the most effective training for two and three, two and three finger pocket holds? And uh, so that, that's a good question. You know, when you grab pockets, you know, like a two finger pocket, you know, it could be any combination or three finger, you know, pockets, uh, combinations. Um, it depends on the architecture of the pocket. Most pockets on plastic holds that are found in the gym tend to be deep and rounded and friendly. So you tend to, you know, grab them as open hand pockets. But oftentimes outside, like here are the limestone at Wild Iris, uh, while you may find some deeper rounded pockets that you open hand on, oftentimes, especially on the harder routes, uh, the pockets will be more shallow, they might have lips on them, and you may actually have to like crimp in them uh, with two fingers. Sometimes you're stacking fingers, you know, or you're stacking three fingers into, you know, kind of gripping a, a, a two finger hold. You know, there's lots of tricks and there's certainly skill to it. Um, so for training the pockets, to some degree, it, it depends on where you're going to go climbing. Uh, if you're mainly an indoor climber, then you could train your pockets almost exclusively as open-handed. Uh, whereas if you know you're going to be climbing at, at a limestone area that has these shallow pockets with lips, you know, the Frankenura is an example of that, where they're almost crimpy pockets. Then, you know, doing some hangboard training uh, where you're grabbing, you know, two finger pockets kind of in a half crimp position can be, can be very, very helpful. Um, and so for base training, getting back to your question, you know, that 753 protocol, uh, I do most of my training uh, in either, you know, the half crimp, you know, again, never, never thumb locking when you're training on a hangboard. Uh, and I do some in the, uh, the open crimp, where kind of um, your shorter fingers are crimping and your longer fingers are open handing. Um, and so it's kind of a hybrid grip. Uh, and you know, that as the mainstay of your hangboard training will transfer nicely to uh, a variety of hold types when you're climbing outdoors or indoors for that matter. Now, that being said, uh, it is, I believe, helpful for it, more advanced people to do some uh, training, some targeted training on individual two-finger teams and even monos, you know, training monos. Uh, I train the, the, the middle finger mono and the uh, ring finger mono uh, carefully, uh, you know, usually on a beast maker board. I'll grab, you know, a, a half crimp with one hand and the mono with the other. And then you can kind of adjust, you know, how much you're pulling or hanging with each arm to, to give a um, comfortable, safe loading of that finger. Uh, and I also do the uh, ring finger in that way. And when I'm feeling really strong, I might do monos on uh, both hands, hanging body weight. Of course, really strong climbers might be yes, adding weight on monos, though that's nothing you want to rush into. Um, you know, so yes, doing some isolation training, you don't need to do a lot, you know, a couple of hangs for each of the different finger pocket grips. Again, doing the majority of your hanging, I think, uh, in half crimp, crimp and open crimp, and maybe three finger drag. Uh, and then, you know, the, the combination of all of that, uh, you know, will 
make you successful at you know getting stronger and all the various uh, grip options. And by the way, one more comment. Um, you know, while the 753 protocol is a max strength protocol, uh, there is also the strength endurance protocol that I recommend, which is uh, you know the 73 repeater protocol, where you're doing six seven second hangs with just a three minute rest. And those repeater protocols are a good time to work all the finger grip positions. So with each repeater hang, you can just swap out different grip positions as you go through the six hangs. Um, and that way it's a strength endurance workout that kind of simulates being at a crag and grabbing different pockets, you know, one after another. Uh, so hopefully that helps you out there, uh, Sam. Okay, on to Greg. Uh, if you could choose one or two consistent exercises to strengthen glutes, hamstrings, for climbing, what would you choose? Well, uh, deadlift would be number one. Of course, I've been a, a fan of the deadlift for about a decade now. Um, nothing crazy, nothing excessive. We're talking, you know, uh, maybe in a training block twice a week, uh, maybe in a non-training performance block, just one maintenance day a week uh, where you do some deadlifts and, you know, like three sets of five reps at a moderate weight. Um, you don't need to go to two or three times body weight like a power lifter would that uh, could get you injured and is just not necessary for climbing. So uh, the deadlift is a good one as long as it doesn't bulk up your lower body. If it does, it, it probably is doing uh, more harm than good because if you're into steep bouldering, steep sport climbing, excessive muscle mass um, anywhere, but especially in your lower body, is counterproductive. Uh, that is a fact. Um, uh, you know, if you have you know big legs and you're climbing slabs, then it might not be uh, much of a liability. But for steep sport climbing, it sure is. It's dead weight that's not needed. Uh, so uh, a, a little bit of deadlifting, getting the dosage just right. Of course, the most specific thing you can do is doing bouldering, where you're doing lots of heel hooks and you know on steep walls, you know toe and heel hooks, where you're really engaging your posterior chain in a climbing specific way. And I think doing a little bit of plyometrics wouldn't be bad. You know, doing some box jumping, some, you know, split squats uh, at just body weight where you're, you know, making some powerful jumps in a, a you know, um, switching the split squat position. And, um, and, you know, maybe even some sprint intervals every now and then. It's a kind of a go-to as part of my aerobic training that uh, while I do some long slow distance running a couple of days a week, every now and then I'll do something that is more like a sprint interval workout that is good for the cardiovascular system, uh, but also is, uh, you know, good, powerful exercise for uh, the lower body, the posterior chain. But, um, you know, the one base exercise I, uh, Greg, would say is uh, the deadlift. Okay, um, Hamza asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the usefulness of uh, wrist wrench or rolling handle training to target wrist strength. Uh, any reason to go for these methods rather than hanging on slope birds? Um, you know, uh, those exercises obviously are not climbing specific, but neither is the deadlift, you know. And so uh, just because something's not climbing specific doesn't mean it's not useful. Uh, so those uh, could be useful tools to, uh, you know, develop wrist strength. You know, we're often you know, talking about climbers needing to strengthen the, the extensor muscles because, you know, when you're gripping, you're doing so much training of your finger flexor muscles here uh, in your forearm that you can develop muscle imbalances. And, you know, for grabbing small holds, uh, you do need to stabilize your wrist. Uh, and so it's the extensors that are uh, important. And so, uh, doing wrist curls and, you know, using a variety of these maybe strongman uh, grip uh, handles and tools could be helpful. Um, I don't think you want to go down this rabbit hole uh, on, you know, uh, you know, the Iron Mind catalog that has uh, all these different strongman gripping devices and tools. They're not climbing specific. And so if that becomes a big part of your training, then you're investing your time uh, poorly. You know, uh, the bulk of your, you know, climbing time should be more climbing specific exercises like, you know, the hangboard or your know, actual climbing, bouldering, system walling, uh, campus boarding, things like that. Uh, and then using those tools for warm ups or for some supplementary exercise, which is surely what you're talking about doing here. So uh, I don't have any uh, problem with doing, you know, a moderate 
amount of those types of uh, exercises. Okay, and here uh, uh, Randy answered my question on, on uh, who got uh, silver. Thank you. Um, on we go. Um, he says, I hope you can answer this. Well, I, I hope so too, and if I can't, I'll be honest and tell you that. Uh, he says he had an LCL injury, grade two tear three months ago. Uh, I was at a good uh, conditioning, doing B7s, my, my best shape. What would you recommend to go back uh, without injuries? Um, so I assume you're talking about a finger injury, uh, collateral ligament, um, though it could be a knee injury, a collateral ligament. Uh, but in either case, you know, those types of injuries, connective, ish, connective tissue injuries take time, uh, regardless of where they're at in the body. Uh, you need to do appropriate loading. You can potentially accelerate the healing and the strengthening with uh, consumption of uh, hydrolyzed collagen, uh, vitamin C enriched like uh, fizzy advantage supercharged collagen. Uh, that can help augment uh, the rehab and the recovery and the strengthening process. Many uninjured climbers use uh, the, that supplement to, um, you know, just as a go-to daily uh, to support their training and climbing, but it could be especially useful in uh, rehabbing uh, injuries. Uh, if it's a finger injury, certainly it could be uh, taped to support that joint uh, as you return to climbing. And uh, I would think that, uh, you know, if the injury was three months ago, uh, you could be out of the woods, assuming it's been a normal recovery. You know, three to four months down the road, you should be okay. And uh, in terms of avoiding future injury, well, you know, don't, um, uh, you know, rush back into, uh, you know, your hardest ever problems. Don't rush back into climbing an excessive amount, like five days a week, I think is too much for most people, um, you know, three to at most four days a week of, you know, pushing yourself pretty hard uh, is the limit for most folks. And after a few weeks of that, you probably need a deload period, a recovery period to kind of let your body catch up. You know, the muscles might recover uh, from the workouts, but the connective tissues may not be. And then that's what leads you down this period or this path of eventually getting an injury. It, you know, you think you're getting enough recovery because you can sense your muscle recovery is sufficient uh, when you're climbing hard four or five days a week. But what you can't sense until you're injured is the connective tissue state. Uh, you know, those injuries are kind of under the threshold of the, the you know, nervous system or the nociceptors to perceive until the injury occurs, unfortunately. Uh, and so they can sneak up on you. And so that's why that deload period can be really beneficial uh, for the connective tissues, uh, you know, where maybe one out of every four weeks you deload. Um, again, everybody is different. There are so many factors, nutrition, rest, genetics, climbing experience, uh, injury history, all those things have an influence on how fast you recover, how quickly you might kind of devolve into becoming uh, an injury prone or risk climber. Um, and so there are uh, no hard and fast rules, I guess I would say. Okay, um, on we go here. Uh, Nicholas gives a shout out to Jonathan. Good luck. Yep, he's heading up to his project uh, this evening to see if it can go. It's, um, you know, he's got, uh, oh, at least a half a dozen sessions in on it. Uh, probably more if you count preliminary work last year, uh, but it's uh, an 80 foot severely overhanging 9A uh, that um, he's actually red pointed to the last hard move. So he's this close, but that last hard move is a legitimate red point crux where I, I think the route's been done three times before and each of those people was falling a lot at that last move, you know, so it's really a heartbreaker, but it's a legit uh, 9A with a legit red point crux at the very, very end. So it's. Uh, you know, it might seem like it's the, the send is near, but really it might not be. So we shall see. Um, okay, uh, Nicholas has a question. Have had tender elbows uh, at the end slash tip. I assume you're thinking this knob here, the epicondyl. For a few weeks now, only hurts when applying body weight, 
slash pressure, wondering if you have experienced this. Uh, or are you talking about under here, uh, the very bottom of the elbow? I, I, I'm not sure specifically where you're talking about here, but you know, elbows are a pain point for climbers, no doubt about it. You can get lateral elbow pain, you can get medial, which is the, cl the classic climber's elbow or golfer's elbow. Uh, and while it is very often um, you know, a, a, a developing tendonitis or it can be a chronic tendinosis here, um, there can be other conditions that mimic that. And you know, so elbows aren't all, you know, there's the ulnar nerve that runs underneath there that can sometimes be compressed, cause pain that mimics uh, a medial epicondylitis. Um, and so um, the first thing to do is to remove whatever provokes it. For a lot of climbers, doing pull-ups provokes the medial elbow pain. And so the first thing you do is you remove like weighted pull-ups from your workout or remove all pull-ups from your workout. Um, you know, try to avoid climbing positions like deep lock-offs that uh, cause pain. Uh, so removing the thing that provokes it could be the first step. Uh, there may be some rehab exercises like pronation, obviously doing some stretching, uh, you know, uh, collagen supplementation, all of these things may help you through the, you know, current problem. Uh, if it becomes long-term, you know, one of these chronic elbow injuries for many months, they can be a bugger to get rid of. And, you know, if you're in that position, you might want to see a physician, a sports medicine doctor to get A, an accurate diagnosis to know exactly what you're dealing with, uh, B, uh, some uh, PT recommendations, uh, you know, what you don't want is total rest, where you just stop climbing and stop training. Yes, the pain may go away, but without loading, uh, the uh, connective tissues can't remodel and strengthen uh, appropriately. Um, and that can actually lead you down, you know, taking the stopping all loading as a um, recovery or attempt to heal it can actually be quite harmful in terms of you get disorganized healing which is a weaker structure um, and will just re-injure when you return to climbing and training. Uh, yeah, so those elbows are pesky. If it's just the first few twinges, it's kind of a caution sign uh, that maybe you're overtraining, overloading, maybe you're malnourished in terms of not getting enough protein, uh, you know, Maybe you just need to remove one or two things that are provoking it, like you know, one arm pull-ups or weighted pull-ups, uh, and then the the situation might correct itself, and you might be able to pass uh, through it without uh, further problem. Uh, but if it becomes this chronic condition that lasts months, that's uh, that's unfortunate, and you definitely want to see a physician uh, or sp sports medicine expert uh, to help you out there. Okay, uh, let's see who is next here. Um, uh, Mario, any suggestion on what seems to be an inflammation causing pain under and the side of the big toe, which is uh, most used point of contact with the foot and the rock? Yeah, well, and I mean, you have these tight shoes on and your toe is really, really bent. And, you know, there are different foot conditions. Uh, that is an injury I'm not an expert at. I've ne never personally suffered, uh, you know, in terms of my toes. <laughs> Other body parts, yes, I've had, uh, you know, my share of injuries, but uh, thankfully not the toes. And I don't have any real advice for you. You know, maybe change shoes, um, uh, you know, maybe in training and in uh Climbing moderates, wear bigger, more comfortable shoes, which is what I do. Uh, and then when you're performance climbing, wear a tighter shoe rather than just forcing your foot into a super tight shoe all the time. Uh, you know, that can uh, help avoid uh, toe injuries. But, you know, if it's affecting your climbing or worse yet, if it's affecting you in real life, just like walking around day to day, definitely you want to see a doctor and get to the bottom what the situation is. Okay, next up, um, what's your best advice for starting double workout days, uh, i.e. a hangboard in the morning and climbing in the afternoon 
Um, and is it better to focus on one muscle group uh, with one workout? Um, very good question. Uh, I am a big fan of that kind of two-a-day uh, training uh, you know, uh, program. Uh, it is a, an elite or you know, a very high-end program. It's not something for somebody new or even a few years into climbing. Uh, but at some point, as you become advanced and elite, you need a lot of um, training time uh, you know, to both climb and do targeted training of different body parts, different energy systems. Uh, and you know, so for instance, you know, when I work with elite level climbers, whether it's my sons uh, or even for a master's athlete like myself or somebody who's on the World Cup circuit, uh, very often during a training block, uh, I recommend a two a day uh, workout. Now, as they're tapering for competition or for performance, or they're actually on a climbing trip, they're, they might just have a little bit of supplemental training and uh, you know, mainly they're climbing at the cliff because um, you know, they're in a performance mode. Um, so, uh, but in any case, if you're in more of a training block, uh, I would recommend uh, two days a week you double up. So it's not something you're doing every day. You know, but uh, for me, like if I'm at home on a training block, uh, it might be that I double up on, you know, a, a Wednesday and on a Saturday. Or sometimes I will double up on consecutive days, Tuesday and Wednesday, then rest Thursday and Friday and maybe climb on the weekend. Uh, but in terms of structuring it, uh, you uh, don't, think, don't think in terms of body part. Think in terms of energy system. So, uh, you know, if you're doing a morning workout, uh, you know, a hangboard workout, it should be, one, one way to do it would be to do a strength power workout. Now you're going to need, if it's in the morning, you're going to need a, a good, you know, progressive warm up. So you just can't rush into doing max hangs or, you know, campusing. Uh, so you need a good 30 to 40 minute warm up where you very gradually get your joints lubricated and your nervous system turned on and the, the temperature and the blood flow up in your working muscles. Uh, and then, uh, you know, then you get into the meat of your workout, uh, which might involve 753 hangs or maybe one arm hangs if you're uh, an advanced climber. Uh, you would, if you're doing max hang protocol, that's a, 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 an alactic energy system uh, workout. So you could couple with that some uh, campus training as well, which is how I often do it and how I often uh, uh, prescribe it for athletes. Uh, and so that whole workout, you know, 30 to 40 minute warm up, and then maybe another 30 to 40 minutes of really intense training. So it could be, an, you know, it's usually an hour to an hour and a half uh, workout in the morning and it's just that one energy system, the uh, anaerobic alactic, max strength, max power. And then after a six or eight hour break, uh, a meal with some carbohydrate and protein, you then have your, your late day workout, late afternoon or could be early evening. Uh, and then you would want to target a different energy system. So it could be uh, that you're at a climbing gym doing uh, system walling which is very anaerobic, uh, lactic, although it, if they're short, it could be alactic. Um, uh, route climbing, which would be more aerobic, uh, and, um, and if you're getting really pumped, uh, anaerobic lactic. Uh, or if you're doing exercises, you could do like, um, you know, more lactic focused training, like bouldering four by fours or pull up intervals, or uh, if you're doing another hangboard workout, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend in the same day, but if you did, you would target a different energy system and maybe do repeaters. Uh, and so think of those two workouts as targeting two different energy systems. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, another day you do morning uh, climbing specific aerobic training as your morning workout. This would be, you know, it could be recovery climbing, like arc training, which is very low intensity, uh, where you don't get pumped at all. It could be more threshold training, where you're getting a light pump. You're kind of taking the aerobic energy system to its limit and maybe just dipping into the lactic system a, a slight bit. So getting a, 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 a you know, light to moderate pump that never goes to failure, anywhere close to failure, you know, where you can kind of climb on through that light pump. 
that's that really good threshold zone that is ideal for training up mitochondria and the circulatory system to really um, uh, build you know, that climbing specific aerobic energy system for route climbing uh, and for hastened recovery between boulder problems. Uh, you know, so you, know, you could do a session like that in the morning and then uh, an evening session that is more lactic oriented. Uh, so there's obviously a number of ways that you can organize it and uh, you know, I can't um, give you what is best for you without knowing a lot more about your situation. Uh, so with that, I will move on here. Um, and I want to try to wrap this up soon. I need to get on with my day here. So uh, let me just see here. Um, uh, da, da, da. Um, I'm going to pick out some new folks here. Um, uh, well, first of all, here's a uh, nice comment. Uh, no question, just want to thank you for writing the great books. Uh, Climber two years have had ups and downs uh, in my progress. Uh, I have both Maximum Climbing and How to Climb 512. Thank you so much. Those are, are two uh, great reads. You know, Maximum Climbing is more the mental training book. It's a book about mastery, and so that's a book you'll be able to revisit a lot in the coming years. The How to Climb 512 book, well, maybe you're getting close to 512, and that book has run its course. Uh, but in any case, maybe if you're going to ever get a third book of mine, Training for Climbing, which is in uh, several uh, different languages, uh, that is a good uh, all-around textbook on training for climbing. Um, I, I hope to do another uh, uh, revised edition of that book in the next couple of years, but I need to find some time to do that. I'm a pretty busy person with all the uh, balls that I have in the air uh, uh, these days. Um, okay, uh, next question. Oh, actually from uh, same person. Uh, what should I expect if I try uh, the Endurex? That's a supplement by Fizzy Vantage. It's a pre-workout for climbers. It's not like the typical pre-workouts for weightlifters that are basically just caffeine and a, a few other things that they throw in there to make you think it's going to make your workout better. But really, most pre-workouts are just caffeine, and Endurex is not that at all. There's no caffeine in it. Uh, Endurex is a, a pre-climb, pre-workout for climbers that uh, really targets the circulatory system, which is so important in climbing, you know, to get that aerobic energy system fully functioning. That way you uh, conserve your anaerobic reserve, which is finite for the hardest moves. And so by strengthening the aerobic energy system and kind of priming it, uh, you will perform better both, not a, you know, both in sport climbing and bouldering and recovering faster and at altitude. Um, and so it has a beetroot extract, it has citrulline malate that work through two different kind of metabolic pathways to um, you know, vasodilate and encourage circulation, uh, you know, the capillary, uh, the endothelial function, the mitochondria function, uh, all are enhanced. Uh, and there's quite a bit of research, not climbing specific research, but enough compelling research with athletes in other sports that these ingredients, if there's a clinically relevant dose, really do work to prime uh, the aerobic energy system. I'm not, it doesn't produce an effect that you feel like caffeine gives you a buzz. Uh, uh, you know, it's not like that. You perceive it when you get on your routes. You, you drink the Endurex and uh, assuming you consume a large enough serving of it, uh, over the course of like an hour as you're warming up to climb or doing your warm up at the, at the gym. Uh, when you get into the meat of your workout, because that aerobic energy system is um, primed and working f more fully than it would be otherwise, uh, you discover you get less pumped. Um, I've had pro athletes who start using it um, and they're working on a, a steep resistance project uh, and they feel immediately like they're getting farther on the route on their red point burns. Um, and yes, my sons do use Endurex, as do I, you know, b before all of their climbing days, uh, you know, because it, it gives an edge that uh, allows you to climb longer with uh, less pump. Um, again, kind of conserving that, that anaerobic reserve uh, for higher up on the climb. Uh, and it's not guaranteed to help you send your project faster, but it, it potentially is a difference maker uh, both in the gym and in climbing performance and in recovery between efforts because, you know, 
your circulatory system, you know, all recovery between bouts of intense climbing or training is aerobic. And so if that aerobic system is functioning better, well, then you are recovering faster between efforts. Uh, and so the Endurex is available here in North America from PhysiVantage.com. Uh, in Europe, it's available from the Epic TV shop uh, or BananaFingers.com. Uh, they are our uh, sole European distributor at this time for supercharged collagen um, and the Endurex. So I hope that answers your question. Um, most climbers do perceive a difference uh, in performance um, and that difference is not um, subjective like I feel you know more powerful or anything like that. It's just that they get on their route and they, they can hang on longer um, and that's a really beautiful thing. <clears throat> Okay, um, and I guess I want to wrap up this uh, conversation, but uh, one more question here. Uh, I have seen a demonstration of H tape for A2 injuries, but not for A4. How would you uh, tape for the A4? Yeah, you know, the H tape uh, method, which has been shown in a couple of books and articles online, uh, you know, over the... Um, uh, you, you're not taping over the pulley, you're actually taping, you're trying to pin the flexor tendon in here um, uh, at the PIP joint. So, you know, you tear the tape into that H configuration and place it right over the uh, PIP joint and, and pull it tight. Here's the problem. Um, and, and this method was documented by my friends, uh, uh, you know, Volker Schofel and uh, his wife, uh, Isabel uh, in Germany uh, and they've done a paper on it and they've done some studies to show that it does work. But here's the problem. Uh, if you use stretchy tape, which is what is common here in the United States, uh, you put on that H tape and after a couple of loads, it's stretched out and it's not providing any benefit. Uh, in Europe, uh, they have this no stretch tape, Leukel tape, and it's you can get it here in the United States now, but it's not the easiest to find. But the Leukel tape, um, it, it still stretches, but less rapidly. So if you tape, you know, that H method over your, um, you know, PIP joint here, um, and I guess you could try it over the DIP joint, though it might be less helpful there. Um, it, it, it even will stretch out after maybe a climb. And so, you know, Folker has commented to me that, you know, even with Leukel tape, you kind of want to reapply a fresh piece of H tape after every route. Uh, and so it's a lot of work. Um, to be honest, I find for myself, because I do, um, I am currently taping my two middle fingers. Uh, they're not currently injured, they were last season. So I'm just kind of as a prophylactic taping when I go out and climb on crimps and, you know, uh, fingery routes. Uh, I do a, a really tight X tape over top. Uh, you know, the X tape, you can wrap around three or four times um, and have the X crossing uh, right at the fold of the skin, um, right where you want to pin the flexor tendons to the bone. Uh, and I tape it, I use Leukel tape, I tape it so tight that um, it's like at first, my finger feels like the circulation is cut off, but I can kind of squeeze, you know, I make sure I can squeeze blood and, you know, that it's not actually cut off. You know, you don't want your finger to, to, to die. Uh, but, um, you know, I get it as tight as I can, you know, right at the edge of cutting off circulation. Um, and if I do three or four wraps of that H tape, uh, I, I, my sense is it holds for most of the day, uh, though it certainly does gradually stretch. And so, you know, the whole taping of pulley things, um, while it seems great in principle, you know, the fact is in reality, m most tapes stretch a lot uh, and the tape becomes quickly ineffective. Uh, and it, uh, I guess at best, becomes a reminder uh, that your finger is injured or was injured and, you know, maybe you need to be careful on it, um, whether it's actually unloading that flexor tendon enough to protect the pulley is another matter. Um, so, uh, you know, I hope that helps you out there. 
Okay, and I guess with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up this episode of the Training Cafe. Thanks uh, for uh, joining me today here uh, in Lander, Wyoming. I've got, uh, you know, uh, one and a half days here yet before I fly out. And uh, so I'm going to try to enjoy some climbing this afternoon and see if I can belay a 9A. Uh, we'll see about that. Um, so uh, hope you're having a, a wonderful summer. I'm going to try to do another Training Cafe uh, two weeks from today. I will be back at Pennsylvania working my heart out, you know, trying to catch up on work and also a little bit of a training block, which I'll talk about post climbing trip training uh, in that next edition. So I hope to see you in two weeks. Until then, be safe, be strong. Climb on, my friends.